Okay, so um, first of all, Peter, would you like to announce the Queensland uh, program for the future, please? Actually got four meetings booked, but I've only got three flyers so far. So our next one is on the 23rd of February, um, which I think is when's that? A couple of weeks time. Um, and that's one of our members, Daryl Holden, is going to be talking about the uh, the Aussie Dam Busters. So that should be quite interesting. Yeah. Then on the 22nd of March, we've got Philip Castle is going to talk about the um, the crash on the Lamington Plateau uh, that um, Bernard O'Reilly was involved in rescuing two of the survivors. I've actually seen that talk at my Probus group, so it's quite a good talk. Then uh, in May, we've got Ian uh. Uh, McDonald talking but uh, on air safety, but I haven't got a fly for that one yet. But in June... Um, Air Commodore John Meyer is going to be talking about the RAAF flying boat experience, which again should be quite interesting. So that's um, the talks that we've got lined up for the next few months. So, Okay. Um, look, I'd uh, like Warwick, I've invited Warwick Bigsburg West to mention something, please, Warwick. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, I just wanted to mention something about uh, Jeff Goodall. Uh, who passed away on the um, 5th of January. Uh, Jeff was not only a colleague of mine in air traffic control, not that we worked side by side, but we did have a lot to, to do with this uh, during our respective careers. But not only that, Jeff was the um, absolute uh, mastermind in Australian aviation history. And unfortunately, in the past year, of course, we've lost Peter Ricketts, Eric Allen, uh, David Eyre and, of course, Jeff Goodall. Um, obituaries have been written in uh, the Queensland, uh, AHSA Queensland newsletter, as well as the AHSA Inc. one, and, uh, and also our newsletter as well. But, of course, we can't do it justice to what Jeff really achieved. And for those who haven't... Um, who haven't seen his website, though I'm sure you all will, uh, Jeff Goodall's uh, aviation history website, which is at uh, goodall.com.au. And it's got an absolute um, mind-blowing amount of inf information, not only about Australian aircraft, but also uh, piston engine air, particularly piston engine aircraft around the world. Um, he had a, of course, Jeff had a huge uh, collection of photographs himself. And he was also always one person who said, I don't put copyright on them because they're there for all to see. They, uh, he should share Australian aviation history. And for that, I was eternally grateful. He certainly helped me with background information on some of the talks that I've given to AHSA uh, Inc. Um, his wish was not to have a public funeral, um, so he was privately interred whether there will be a, um, a commemorative service at some stage later, I do not know. That'll be in the uh, uh, domain of either his family or AHSA Inc. in Melbourne. One particular funny thing that I always rem remember about Jeff was that um, he said when he was exploring around uh, the United States, the Americans couldn't get over this G-E-O-F-F, the spelling for Jeff. And he said they used to call him Geoff <laughs> rather than Jeff. Anyway, he will be missed, as you would all know. And uh, the, uh, it's a sad time for Australian aviation history. Thanks, Thanks, Tom. Two things very, very quickly. On his website, there's a place where you can leave a message. And uh, a general plea, um, all you people out there with huge amounts of aviation knowledge, Please try and digitise it or at least type it. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Gary Sunderland from Victoria. If we could only preserve his spidery right handwriting, we'd have uh, a, a wealth of historical ma material. But yes, I'm very grateful to Jeff too. Well, I'll now hand over to Peter Dunn, who will press the play button, and I'll sit back and throw rocks at the speaker. Thank you, uh -huh. Peter. Welcome, um, and thank you for your interest in this amazing story. 
little bit of housekeeping. I always put too much detail on my slides. The theory is that uh, if you want to find out a little bit more, download the recording which will be available and uh, you'll be able to read every word. But in the meantime, let's get moving. The Royal Australian Air Force was developed in 1919 as a result of the Imperial gift when the British gave Australia 100 plus aircraft to form its own air, air, air force. A comprehensive lot of aeroplanes, but there are no seaplanes, which were quite fashionable, and Prime Minister Billy Hughes approved the purchase of six seaplanes, um, thinking that they would be very useful in Australia. This is the story centred around Ferry A-10-3, the first aircraft to fly around Australia. Ferry wasn't a small aircraft, about, uh, the Tiger Moth was about uh, two-thirds the length. But actually the performance of the ferry was much the same as that of a Tiger Moth. It had a much more powerful engine, but uh, the floats created a lot of drag. So you're looking at an aircraft that can cruise at 90 mile an hour, 140k an hour, uh, and uh, subject to uh, weather conditions in a great degree. To prepare a flight for such an aircraft, you needed a considerable logistic feat, in fact, a huge logistic feat. 37 dumps of petrol and uh, oil and distilled water were placed around the country and um, only about 24 of them were used. Um, but they had to be guarded 24 hours a day. It was a huge enterprise to get the whole thing going. War is indeed a terrible thing, but for some people it's a vehicle for considerable social mobility. Stanley Goebel was the son of a station master. He followed his father into the railway profession and uh, was very successful at 23 years as a station master himself. War broke out and just like most of the young men of the time, he tried to volunteer in the Australian services, but was refused at this early stage for minor health problems. So he paid his own way to England and joined the Royal Naval Air Service in July. 1915. His career was absolutely stellar. Uh, it was, deserves a complete pre presentation of its own, but I'll just mention one feat. When the Germans uh, made their 1918 offensive to defeat the uh, British and French before the Americans arrived, after the, they defeated the Russians, Stanley Goebel was the commander of 8 Squadron Royal Naval Air Service and uh, the lines were pushed back 100 kilometres. He won great praise for his ability to keep the aircraft fighting and flying during the offensive. The whole process was carried out with railway efficiency and uh, he won great, uh, he, he was regarded as being very successful for carrying that feat out. He finished the war with uh, a considerable number of bravery decorations and with the rank of major. The other person in the, par in the aircraft was Ivor McIntyre. He was an Englishman who came to Australia in um, 1923 and proved to be a brilliant pilot, particularly of seaplanes and in bad weather. More about him later on. In the Infant Australian Air Force, Richard Williams was the Commander-in-Chief and Stan Stanley Goebel was effectively the second in command. Williams had been supported in the role by the Army. He had a great career in Mesopotamia mainly and Goebel had been supported by the Navy. So it seemed logical that Williams should be the boss and Goebel should be second in command. The problem is they hated each other with a huge intensity uh, and it was necessary for them to be sort of kept apart. Well, Williams was overseas when uh, Goebel got approval for the flight and uh, uh, dispensed the uh, supplies as we've described uh, previously and prepared a, a, a 10 which had the last hours on its engine. The radio was removed 
a auxiliary fuel tank was put in, the floats were strengthened as much as possible, and uh, they were ready to go. For weight reasons, personal luggage was kept to a minimum. According to Smith Weekly, they didn't even carry a change of clothing, but did carry 303 rifles and ammunition for fear of being attacked by hostile natives. So they took off from Point Cook on Sunday the 6th of April and almost immediately ran into trouble with the first of several forced landings. And the first landing was at this beautiful spot corner inlet in what's now Wilson's Promontory National Park and they had to repair a leak in the auxiliary fuel tank. That meant that uh, instead of being able to fly all the way to Sydney, they had to land at Eden, which had been previously established as a base for the seaplanes. Uh, and uh, then they satisfactorily flew on to, England, uh, to Sydney and arrived at 4 p.m. The, in the flight, the compass exploded. The uh, air, air, Alcohol leaked all over McIntyre, and uh, they uh, set, took the aircraft compass to the experimental station of the RWF, run by one Lawrence Wackett, to be repaired. This picture is believed to be at Rose Bay, where they landed. The next day, they flew from Sydney, hoping to get all the way to Brisbane, but near Newcastle, there was a huge storm and uh, they had to fly at uh, 50 feet because of low visibility. And uh, luckily there's a break in the storm and getting a glimpse of the Mile River just north of Port Stephens, they landed safely. It was a frightful night, the gale blew all night and they had to prevent the aircraft being washed ashore. Uh, this is a rough map of the area. You can see the opening of the Mile River, they must have landed fairly well down because as you go further up the river, it's uh, brackish water, but uh, they described uh, the difficulty of taking off uh, downstream, dodging the oyster leases, so they must have been quite close to Port Stevens. The next day they had a, a, I'm sorry, on Wednesday the 9th of April, they had a pretty good flight to Southport. Southport, of course, was just developing as a as a the area that we now know as surface paradise. The early part of the flight didn't get much publicity, but a newspaper from Brisbane uh, published these pictures of uh, Goebel. Uh, it's an ideal place for a seaplane landing. The Cavill uh, family were just beginning to develop the area for tourism. The next leg was to Gladstone. Not a bad flight, except when they landed, when they tried to land uh, coral in the harbour and mud, mud and logs in the river forced them to land at Facing Island, about 10 miles away. The petrol was brought over uh, in a launch and uh, they worked for four hours fueling the aircraft. The fuel was so bad that they had to strain it through chamois leather, leather to make sure it was relatively pure. Uh, sleep was bad, sleep was impossible because of sand flies. They uh, lit a fire on the beach with uh, empty cases and half a, uh, half a gallon of petrol. There is a bit of controversy about where they landed, but this seems to be the more authoritative version. Next flight was to Townsville. Not a bad sort of flight. They orbited over Bowen and Mackay to the delight of the townspeople and were escorted into the beach by a huge shark. They waited for a repaired compass and uh, the aircraft was taxied up the river and hoisted onto the shore. They worked on the floats again and uh, they were badly affected by mosquito and fan sand fly bites. McIntyre had a badly affect infected finger. The work that they had done was very hard. I just want to break in here and tell a, bit, a story about what happened later. The ferries were the originators of aerial survey in Australia, particularly in the Barrier Reef, and A3 returned after the flight to initiate this uh, survey. It, the aircraft was carried in, on HMS Geranium. Beautiful photograph of uh, the uh, time.
but most after a while they decided they'd base the aircraft at Townsville and they would fly out to the to the uh, geranium rather than being launched from the geranium. Anyway, back to the story. Next flight to Cooktown. Uh, a little bit of uh, turbulence on landing. They landed safely on the Endeavour River, and uh, McIntyre was so ill he stayed in bed while. Uh, Gobel looked after the aircraft during the night of heavy rain and strong wind. Uh, we're pretty sure that that is a picture taken out. Next stage of the flight was to Thursday Island. Uh, again, they had uh, to pass through some torrential rain squalls, which wouldn't be in, which wouldn't be a lot of fun. Gobel could hardly see McIntyre in the front cockpit, and the ferry was very difficult to control. They had to land on the open sea and decide what to do next. They decided to climb over the clouds, but that didn't work. They navigated by compass bearing to uh, Thursday Island and eventually managed to land in a break in the storms. And this was a very important stop. There's a huge stock of fair, spare parts and even a spare engine. Uh, it was not certain whether the flight would continue after Thursday Island, but uh, despite uh, the problems that they were facing ahead of them, the aviators were keen to proceed. Thursday Island in 1924 was quite a developed little township, and an amazing feat of um, ingenuity was applied by the RWF mechanic Corporal Gurr. They decided to flip you fit new floats which were on hand, so they improvised this crane called a shear legs, um, two pieces of wood with a whole lot of pulleys behind them, and uh, um, did quite a good job of repairing the aircraft. Up till now they'd followed the coast, but the only way to proceed was to fly across the Gulf of Carpentaria at the maximum range of the aircraft to Elko Island. There was no other way of making the flight. Now, this was a real go or no go decision. If the winds were unfavorable, they wouldn't reach Elko Island. If the engine stopped, which had a propensity for doing, and they had to land in the open sea, there were very few vessels in the area and uh, the prognosis would be very grim. The compass had completely broken and uh, McIntyre sitting in the front seat was guided by string reins pulled by Goebel from the back seat. Goebel had an, a working compass. Anyway, takeoff was uh, at 6.40 a.m. Uh, they stripped out everything that they could for the aircraft, but it's interesting that they decided that they'd have to take the guns and ammunition because the natives might be restless. They, about uh, an hour and a quarter after leaving Thursday Island, the wind changed and so they had problems there. The engine started misfiring. Imagine that when you're the only living thing within 100 miles, maybe. And uh, they had quite a reasonable flight and when land was sighted, that they were only 12 miles off course after, after their flight of uh, 410 miles of open sea. Adventures on them. Um, Elko Island, oh, they had to adjust the valves and uh, the faulty calculation and they worked on that till late at night. Some of the more adventurous Aborigines came down and watched them. There's a story that one said uh, that uh, the engine was running badly. Mine croaky, mine tinker, this fella got a bad belly ache. But when Goble climbed up to the air, uh, Goble climbed up to the air, uh, board, to the cockpit and flied a fired a flare to the, the natives charged off into the bush and were not seen again. Another account by the Air Force historian says that uh, some natives came down, we had a gallon of petrol oil and a gallon of distilled water left over, we poured the petrol on the beach and dropped a match and set the sand on fire. Then we gave the distilled water to the Aborigines, they pl flew blazing torches into it which, would, which sputtered and went out. And finally, to dismiss the audience, Gobel flied into the, into, the, uh, into the air, red very light, and the natives went running off.
This negative attitude towards the Aborigines was quite common and uh, rather unfounded. When Hudson and Fish made their exploratory journey across the north of Australia, preparing for the Smith flight of 1919, uh, they uh, also were heavily armed in case of uh, bad experiences with the natives. But the plain fact of the matter is they just wouldn't have got through without the sort of assistance that you see in this picture. Those attitudes were of their time, but uh, they need to be recorded and thought about. The Aboriginal name for the modern settlement on uh, Elko Island is Galawinku. It has a completely different reputation from what it had in 1924. This is the uh, display of traditional art of uh, Elko Island, which is in the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. It's the home of Gallery Unipingo. It was the inspiration for the hit song, My Island Home. And it's quite a different uh, sort of scene. Uh, it's a lovely little township. Uh, completely controlled by the local Aboriginal community. There are very few uh, European people living there. Uh, the Shepherdson College, the school, has got a wonderful reputation for intercultural education. Um, and it's a very successful settlement. Uh, it has restricted access and you have to apply to the Northern Land Council to, or, to get there. So on to Darwin. Again, a not easy flight, but at least this time they're flying along the coast. On landing at Darwin, they were great to relieve. They shook hands with each other and uh, they were terribly frightened of the previous stages that the engine might uh, stop. At Darwin, which was a very small place at the time, a couple of thousand population, the air aircraft was hoisted onto the wharf and uh, they overhauled the carburetors and magnetos and again suffered gravely from the sun. Now the next step I need to explain um, a couple of things. It's Darwin to Napier Broome Bay which is halfway to Broome itself. Napier Broome Bay or it's also known as Mission Bay and uh, it's, um, it, the settlement was on the coast it's now been uh, superseded by the modern Kalamburu further up the Drysdale River. So this is the halfway stop between Darwin and Broome. Aviators landed with some trepidation. They weren't sure whether the natives were friendly, but they were met by the uh, Spanish missionary and all was well. Uh, they got uh, well fed and uh, returned to refuel the plane. And the uh, missionaries provided a dinner of kangaroo tail and the natives put on a special corroboree. Now this was an area of extreme tides and uh, Gogol and McIntyre were caught unawares. Uh, the low tide uh, was going to cause huge damage to the aircraft so the Aboriginal people were called from their beds to help push the seaplane into deeper water. Again by way of thanking the natives they gave a demonstration of setting the sea on fire with petrol to the vast amusement of the community. Again, very patronising attitude, but realise that this is 100 years ago. This was Drysdale River Mission, an outpost of the Benedictine Monastery of New Norcia. Uh, you can see here the, mission, the missionary's home, which was built uh, up high so that they couldn't be easily attacked by natives. And they there were a few nights when they were quite scared of this. But um, it's happy to note that uh, the situation has vastly improved and the mission remains an important and valuable element of Calvary society. Um, again, damage the flight, to the floats. They had a good flight to Broome. Again, uh, huge tidal variations there and they were joined by leading aircraftman Scotch Chalk. He is a, a legendary mechanic and uh, from then on he is able to fly in the aircraft to obviously remove the extra fuel tank. Uh, they'd actually sort of reached uh, 
an area which had good communications and the Broome correspondent of the Melbourne Herald wrote a big article dealing with the stopover at Napier Broome Bay. Pearling was the main industry at the time. Uh, there aren't many good photographs of uh, Broome at the time and uh, this just shows the ships in the port. On the 29th of April, they took off to fly to Port Headland. The sea was very rough and uh, the floats were again damaged on takeoff. So when they arrived at Port Headland, they decided to stay there the rest of the day because the next sheltered harbour was Carnarvon, two stages further on. Onslow was the next stop, but it only had an open beach. To Port Headland, with a refuelling on, at Onslow, um, uh, a very difficult refuelling job. They were stuck on a sandbank where they were, they had to um, free themselves and uh, and uh, load the water, load the fuel in deep water. The next day they found that the engine had uh, lost power and uh, uh, Gottschalk um, found that two valves had been sent out and worked for two days without success. So in the end they sent to Perth for a new engine. And two mechanics uh, left Perth on the 5th of May and uh, traveled on the train as far as they could, then another 640 kilometers by road and uh, Kotschop fitted the engine uh, and they were able to depart on Sunday the 7th of May. They also removed the extra radiator that had been installed. Carnarvon to Perth, a really frightening story here. Um, heavy rain and uh, landing sea for the landing in uh, Geraldton. Uh, the residents were very hospitable and children climbed all over the aircraft. 45 minutes after takeoff, the engine suddenly cut out. They landed in the open sea and found that somebody had moved, removed the binding wire from the drain cock on the auxiliary tank and the petrol had emptied into the sea. Well, they were still able to take off again, but uh, a hair-raising affair with uh, the waves breaking over the lower wings. But they managed to take off despite the fact that got shocked their mechanic weighed 14 stone. They landed at... Uh, Earth to a huge reception. Photographs in newspapers these days were a rarity, but here we see a full page uh, uh, spread on uh, the Goebel story. It mentioned that uh, Mrs. Goebel had been interviewed at her Melbourne home, and uh, some of the reporters said, Was well, she worried because at that time nothing had been heard from them for some days? And she said, No, I have perfect confidence in my husband's ability. And she got a lot of favourable publicity at the, as a result. I don't want to give the impression that they're the first aircraft along the West Australian coast. Far from it. Western Australian Air Airlines had been conducting regular services since September 1921. And uh, they had just opened a huge new airport for the time at Maylands in Perth. An early pilot was Kingsford Smith. And here we see him taking off in a... Bristol um, freighter, modified fighter, uh, on the Derby to Broome service. Um, the prime mover was Norman Brearley, who is uh, uh, greatly underrated as an aerial pioneer, particularly in the eastern states, I hasten to add. And uh, Kingsford Smith was a pilot at the time in his Perth to Albany, a pretty good run. Again, met by hordes of children, but this time they uh, uh, got the police to look after the aircraft. A false start in the next uh, leg uh, the next day because the weather turned bad. And you've got to realise that in this sort of an aircraft, a, uh, a 20 or 30 uh, mile an hour wind is, is, causes huge problems with the speed of the aircraft. On the 14th, they uh, sheltered, and on the 15th, they took off for Israelite Bay, which was a telegraph station and uh, by the coast because the telegraph line followed the coast. Uh, and uh, there's a total population of four who made the, uh, uh, the uh, pilots very welcome. 
the, all that is left of Israel at bay is the ruins that you can see on the right. The next stage was uh, pretty exciting, but they had a successful day in covering a, quite a distance to uh, Sidjuna, the longest flight in a single day, a little over a thousand kilometers. So a mixture of cliffs going down to the sea and uh, um, beaches on which they could have landed uh, safely if necessary. Um, Eucla people had asked them to land, but the surf was too rough, so they dropped a message. Fowler's Bay had a, a fuel dump, but uh, water was too rough to land, so they flew on to Sejuna. So the stopping at Sejuna is sometimes called Murat Bay, sometimes Denial Bay, because uh, when Flinders explored the country, he thought it might be an entrance to the inland sea, but it wasn't, so that's why he named it that. Uh, the, this was the first aircraft in the area. The, uh, pilot, the people were ecstatic. Lots of people came out to greet them, and they hoped that there would soon be a regular service. Lovely photograph of the aircraft the next day at Bridgeport, at Beachport, uh, one of the high quality photographs of the whole event. Beachport to, uh, Beachport to Point Cook via St Kilda. Uh, they flew up uh, Port Phillip Bay, picking up uh, um, another ferry 3D uh, and 15 other aircraft in formation who escorted the seaplane to St Kilda, where a huge crowd had gathered. They'd been kept informed of what was happening by telegraphs and uh, radiograms. They were welcomed by the state governor and members of the federal government. They were carried along the pier by fellow officers and friends, greeted by the mayor and councillors of St Kilda. Uh, might be able to see a film of that later on. After the flight, Gable and McIntyre were the recipients of the Britannia Trophy for the most outstanding flight in the British Empire. McIntyre received the Oswald Mott Watt medal for 1924 for the most outstanding feat as a pilot. Both men were appointed CBEs. Goebel continued his service career, retired after World War II and died in 1948. He retired as Vice Admiral Stanley James Goebel, CBE, DSO, DSC, better known to his friends as Jimmy, and is still remembered by the annual presentation of the SJ Global Memorial Trophy for the most proficient pilot graduate each year in the RAAF. This flight sort of set a fashion for similar flights. Uh, the, director of the Director of Civil Aviation, Hector Brinsmain, flew around Australia inland in September 1924. Uh, Brinsmain had recently been appointed uh, Director of Civil Aviation and uh, he insisted on high standards of airworthiness, qualified pilots and all sorts of things, which didn't make him terribly popular with a lot of the cowboy pioneers. And uh, quite, a, quite a, a feat of flight. 1924 was a, a, a time when a lot of things happened. Uh, Lawrence Wackett, as I mentioned before, had taken over what was in uh, the called the Naval Wireless Workshops at Randwick and was well underway to produce the Australian Wackett Witten seaplane, which was quite so successful, but uh, not produced in quantity. Qantas was in action in Queensland and fitted out its first aerial ambulance. The Aero Club movement was taking shape. The government has, had decided that Australia needed pilots, so they subsidised the Aero Clubs by play, providing aircraft and uh, also subsidising training. Richmond Aircraft New South Wales was being refurbished as an RAAF base. Um, and uh, really, since that time, it hasn't looked back. Uh, interesting report of a major air show at Essington, Essendon showing uh, the latest airlines such as the DH-50 and sporting aircraft. Uh, balloon chasing was carried out by the DH 53 Hummingbird, and there were displays of aerobatics, mock dog, dog fights, and smoke bombings. Uh, there's a similar display at Richmond, sponsored by Lebius Horden, the first person to own a seaplane.
Williams returned to Australia in 1926 and the malicious um, biographers say that he is very jealous of uh, Goebbels' flight so immediately set out to better it. And certainly in September 1926, he flew from Point Cook around Australia to the Solomon Islands and New Guinea in a de Havilland 50A, which had been imported for the Governor General to as a VIP aircraft, but it was reconfigured as a seaplane. Uh, quite an amazing flight. Uh, we've got the story of it here. The D have one seems to have been a lot more reliable than the ferry, but it still required a couple of engines in flight. They had uh, a number of adventures in the in the flight, including in the last leg as they came back to Southport, uh, when uh, the aircraft had to land in the open ocean and McIntyre was repairing the engine and twice thrown into the water. Pretty terrifying. Uh, Williams had a CBE, McIntyre a bar to his AFC, and Trist, the other mechanic, an AFM, the first two would be awarded in the RAAF. McIntyre again received the Oswald, got, Oswald Watt Gold Medal for Pilot Excellence in 1926, and only he, Bert Hinkler, and Charles Kingsford Smith have been awarded the medal more than once. McIntyre continued his flying career, being involved in the Barrier Reef Survey, as we talked about before. He left the RAAF in 1927 to become the flying instructor for the South Australian Aero Club and was killed in a crash in May 1928. He was certainly a remarkable pilot and uh, essential to the success of the flight. Well, what happened to A-10-3? As I mentioned, it performed the first Barrier Reef survey. Uh, more details are on this slide. But in September 1924, with commendable uh, thought for the future, the government withdrew A-10-3 from use and donated it to the Australian War Museum in Melbourne at the time, because Canberra course, had still been, not been built in. It was advert, uh, exhibited throughout the countryside and these displays were very popular. But the AWM Board of Trustees, in their wisdom, decided that the aircraft did not meet the criteria for storage and display in the War Museum, as it had not served during the war. It was dismantled and stored in Victoria Barracks. barracks. Lots of people were offered it to be displayed and uh, unfortunately nobody took it up and the aircraft just disappeared. The ferries had their weaknesses, particularly as we've seen with the floats. And in 1926, three Supermarine Seagull three seaplanes took over the servo work. The ferries were listed as trainers, but they seldom flew. The condition was poor, spare parts were in short supply, and uh, they required a lot of work. The final three seaplanes were all destroyed in 1928-29 and Geranium was replaced by HMS Moresby. The Walrus Seagulls and Moresby uh, kept on working as uh, survey aircraft until Moresby was scrapped in uh, 1952. There is only one surviving ferry 3D and it's in the Portuguese Naval Museum. Jago Tocino was the Kingsford Smith of Portugal, uh, a famous a a a aviator also responsible for many technical uh, improvements, including navigation. And he flew a ferry three from Portugal to Brazil. Interesting story. Um, the first aircraft took off and uh, landed at various islands across the southern Atlantic until it reached St Peter and Paul Rocks where there was a reef and they had a refueling vessel. Unfortunately, the aircraft was damaged in a storm and uh, sank. So they sent a second aircraft. Exactly the same thing happened. 
So they sent a third, and this time they were able to refuel it and fly into Buenos Aires, where it uh, was uh, received with great enthusiasm as uh, the first aircraft to fly the South Atlantic. And uh, we're fortunate that it's still on display as the final ferry in existence. For the 1924 flight, there were no commemorative stamps, but the children's magazine Pals produced uh, stickers for Goebel. And uh, interestingly, uh, this block of four was sold for $1,500 in uh, 2009. Australia Post also produced a $1.35 uh, commemorative uh, um, stamp in 1974. Also in 1974, a, an F-111 of the uh, RAAF flew around Australia, uh, making uh, only a couple of stops and, of course, far quicker than the uh, F-33. And uh, interestingly, the pilot for the F-111 was Ray Fennell, later chief of the air staff. Uh, those are still available. Um, we don't know uh, what, if any, will be the philatelic, philatelic uh, outcomes of uh, the current. The ferries really started a trend for seaplanes in Australia. And we've mentioned the supermarine, supermarine uh, seagull and walrus. They also bought a couple of large supermarine Southampton flying boats in 1927. In 1938, short Empire flying boats were used for direct flights for the UK. And of course, during the war, the Catalina served Australia magnificently and there are other seaplanes as well. But during the war, the development of airfields meant that the more efficient land planes replaced the flying boats. Uh, what's happened in recent years is that uh, Australia has uh, become a, a haven for light recreational use of seaplanes, and we have a very strong community, as you'll see in a moment. 100 years on, Michael Smith, the Australian Geographic Adventurer of the Year in 2016, will trace the global flight following the original route in his modern seaplane, Southern Sun. The towns and dates will be followed as closely as possible, and uh, the idea is to celebrate the wonderful flight. At the same time, another group of seaplanes and their pilots led by David Jeers in his Sea Ray will circumnavigate Australia clockwise in, a, in an adventure to celebrate the 100th anniversary also. Please read the details on the various websites, especially fwaf.com.au, where here we have uh, Michael's uh, map and David Jesus map is uh, done on Google, uh, Google Earth and provides amazing detail and well worth some time looking at it. So as I say, those are the two websites. So I want to finish by mentioning that to the top priorities as well as having fun are safety, safety and safety. So although we'll be keeping the websites up to date with the real time itineraries, they'll change it uh, moment's notice to keep things safe, particularly for the smaller aircraft. You're welcome to fly along with David's flight for as long as you like, understand its CASA rules, and uh, you participate entirely at your own responsibility. Land planes are also welcome to fly along. The aviators would love to meet people along the way, and they'd love information about your area, including such things as camping spots and accommodation. Anthony Calero uh, is collecting information about landing places and uh, I'm the historian and uh, I'm having a great time picking up information all over the place and putting together this rather amazing story. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, so thanks very much for listening to the story. I hope there was a little, little bit in it. There, there is a, a two-minute film which we might be able to look at later on if, uh, if uh, you'd like to. Uh, but any questions, comments, and 
I've got a prize for the person who picks uh, out the worst error in that story. It's uh, a little arriving. book that we've written about the flight. Arriving. So first in. Arriving in Sydney at something a.m. in the morning, is that right? Oh, I'll, I'll count that one. I'll, I'll give you that. If that's not the one I had in mind. I've got plenty more books. <laughs> There's one that's a real beauty. For the second time of asking, uh, I said he retired as Vice Admiral rather than Vice Air Vice Marshal, so bad luck you missed out that. It's up to have it out the AM, was it? <laughs> You've already got one of these, so that's good. Yeah, uh, so Tom. Tom, uh, and Tom, yeah. I think uh, Richard Williams was uh, Chief of the Air Staff, he was never Commander in Chief of anything. Fair enough, I'll pass that one. Uh, Chief of the Air Staff, because, uh, yeah, okay. Yep. Right, I'll, ma I'll get your address and I'll mail you one of these. Put Thanks, your address in the, in the chat. And Tom, yep. the RWF wasn't founded until 1921, 1919. And even wow, though that's the, a bad error. And even though the RAFs celebrate their birthdays the 1st of April, they weren't given their royal warrant until August. Yes, I knew that. that. Yeah. I knew and that. I, uh, I'm sorry, it's on. not the 1st of April. It's not the 1st of April. Oh, sorry, the 31st of March. Sorry, it's the Royal yeah. Air Force. The, the Royal Air Force are the clowns mm. out on the 1st of April. <laughs> that was a dumb error. Um, uh, brought about by the confusion with the imperial gift, which was quite an interesting story. Mm. So the person who mentioned that, put your address in the uh, in the uh, chat, please. And any other questions, comments, criticisms, or additions? Just one apology from Michael. Um, he was on board and uh, he had a generator fail. <laughs> and, uh, the swap over kicked him off and uh, he wasn't able to get back on. So he just wanted okay. me to pass on well, his apologies for not... And, he did say if you're recording it, he'd love to get a copy of the recording yep. and uh, pass yeah, it on. Yeah, we are, we well, are recording to, it. Yep. Thanks to Peter, it'll be, uh, be uh, recorded be fairly soon. Be on YouTube. Okay. Any other questions, I, comments? I found that uh, fascinating. I really enjoyed that. It was well done. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah. No, thanks, Mary. You're you're always very uh, very charitable in assessing my my talks. It's great. I only tell the truth. <laughs> Good on <laughs> you. <laughs> Gets me in trouble, though, I must say. <laughs> Sorry? It, it can get me in trouble at times, I must say. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, um, Peter, are we able to show that movie? Yeah, I'll show that video. Eh? Okay, so um... we'll finish with that. Uh, after the movie, uh, anyone who'd like to stay and chat is very welcome. And uh, so we'll... Uh, uh, but uh, Tom, uh, just before we go, I know Kathy uh, is very keen on doing some presentations as she goes around Australia with me. Yes, um, Kathy, did you want to sort of mention something before we go into the movie? Or I, I am very keen, as you guys say in Australia, to interact with as many people as David and I can on our way around. Our real mission is to promote STEM education for everyone and especially diversity in a lot of aviation occupations. Uh, you know, I've been a pilot for over 53 years. I first soloed in 1970. And back then in the United States, only about five to 6% of all pilots were female. And now it's only increased by about 2%. So that's pretty miserable. And we're hoping to because I'm old, I'm going to be reaching my 70th birthday on the trip, uh, you know, inspire uh, more mature women as well as young girls and everyone else that, you know, hey, if a girl can do it, maybe you can think about an aviation career too. And, and I'm happy to talk to schools. I will be talking in Brisbane when we arrive. I'm already scheduled at the Aviation High School in Brisbane to talk to some of their students. So if anybody knows of opportunities uh, that can be flexible because, you know, where we're going to be staying and landing is still, you know, we'll be up in the air for the whole entire trip. You know, we will be making our final decisions on a day by day basis. But if anybody can be flexible, we are, uh, I am very excited to talk to news media or, you know, local groups, whatever. Thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. Beauty. Okay. Yeah, that's better. So there's no sound on this.
It's a very early example of graphics. I don't know how early, whether it's 1924 or not. Obviously, the later film is 1924. Mm. Obviously, making the point for overseas use that Australia is pretty big. <laughs> Strange way of doing it. This is pretty obviously taken at uh, um, St Kilda on the landing. Yeah. St Kilda. You know, I can imagine them. Um, everybody rushing to chair Michael in when he returns. <laughs> Look at all those hats. Yeah. Look at all that wind. That's <laughs> Michael yeah. will be landing in that sort of. That yeah. looks like about twenty knots of. Wind, I don't think you'll be wanting to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's a very early uh, bit of aviation movie there. The Smiths had one, and I haven't been able to find many others before then. And that's a day eight something or other, which I don't know what it is. I don't know what the relevance is. That might have been just an escort as they were coming back in. Could be, could be. That makes sense, doesn't it? Um, yes, uh, the Women's Pilots Association uh, is certainly something we've got to get in touch with very quickly, uh, Kathy Bowers. And uh, I had hoped that uh, we'd have some other people uh, here today anyway. Um, okay, so any more comments? If not, uh, yeah, you can drift off as you're ready, and uh, I'll just hang around in case anyone else would like to say anything. So thanks very much for coming.